Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Japan Europe Forum 2021. It is quite a special day today. Uh, not only did we pick an excellent date in general, because the 20th of January 2021 seems like a very, um, yeah, a particularly good day to, to look into the future and to look for um, what are the new opportunities out there. We mark the end of the Trump era today for now, at least. Um, let's see what comes. And we can definitely say that the world has gone through massive changes over the last four years. One of the steady points in this has been the Japan-Europe relationship um, that has definitely kind of been further strengthened um, and has been one of the anchors of stability in, in ever-changing circumstances. I hope that we can further strengthen and extend the relationship between Europe and Japan. Uh, and this is what the Japan-Europe Forum is designed for. We're very grateful for the help and the support over the many years now with the Japanese embassy here in Berlin. It's been a fantastic cooperation also this year. It is very, very early in the day. So I think uh, we definitely need a few coffees to get ready, which is a huge strategic advantage for our Japanese participants, at least through the early hours of this, of this meeting. Um, but I think the Europeans will catch up. Just give us a little bit of time and then we will be all ready um, for, uh, for full brain capacity after the first or second coffee. We will start this first day of the Japan Europe Forum with a public session. So I do not only welcome all of our Japan Europe Forum participants in the Zoom call, but also uh, the participants on our live stream that are able to kind of participate and um, be, be, um, be part of the conversations that are going on. We will have a second session today that will be off record and we will meet again tomorrow as well for further off record sessions. Um, and as with all virtual meetings, I think this is really, really important Technical glitches are always possible. Uh, things can go wrong. So bear with us, have a sense of humor um, and a little bit of patience. Whatever happens, we will try to fix it. So just stay calm um, and log in again if something goes wrong. And if we somehow magically disappear, just be patient, we will be back. Um, we all hope that this is the last Japan Europe Forum, the first and last that will have to be held virtually and that we will be welcome, we'll be able to welcome all of you again in person in Berlin next year. Um, I think I would like to promise that to you. I think it should be, uh, that should be something that, that we should be doing. Um, but for now, we will make the best of this situation um, with a stellar lineup of speakers, fantastic moderators and good discussions. I would like to thank the entire EC of our Asia program team, namely Manisha Reuter and Jan Reinermann for their excellent work in putting all of this together and making this possible. And I will now hand you over uh, to Eli Katharina Polkam, who's our brand new visiting fellow for Japan at the EC of our Asia program and a dear friend. And I'm glad that Eli will take over the floor, the live stream um, and the conversation. Eli, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Janka. So welcome and good morning, Europe. Good afternoon, Japan. Uh, welcome everyone in the Zoom call and on the live stream to our first session on Europe and Japan after the US elections. So as Janka said, my name is Ellie Polkamp and I am the visiting fellow for Japan at ECFR's Asia program and I will be moderating this panel today. So we have some very esteemed panelists and experts today to talk about the impacts of the new Biden administration, the Indo-Pacific region, China policy and what it means for key allies such as Europe and Japan. And there could be no better day than Inauguration Day to talk about all these issues. So before I introduce you to our panel, um, some organizational remarks for every participant in the Zoom call. So we will start with the three input statements of our panelists. And after that, we will open the Q&A session. So in order to ask your questions, please use the raising hand button below and you will be able to ask your question personally and directly. So you will be zoomed in the panel to ask your question. So please only use the raising hand button for this. So let me introduce you to our wonderful panel. So we have Professor Michito Tsuruoka from Japan. Dr. Tsuruoka is an associate professor at Keio University. And prior to joining Keio University, he was a senior research fellow at the National Institute for Defense Studies in Japan. So welcome to this session. Then we have Céline Pajon. Céline is a senior fellow and the head of Japan research at the French Institute for International Relations. And she's a senior fellow at the Japan program of Brussels University. So welcome, Celine. 
And finally, we have Andrew Small. Andrew is a senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States and an associate senior policy fellow at ECFR's Asia program. So welcome, Andrew. <laughs> So we have a lot of things to discuss about. As Janka said, we had some challenging years the last four years. We had a quite uh, absent US in terms of leadership in the region. We had a very assertive China to deal with. We have a very proactive Japan at the moment, diplomatically and strategically with its free and open Indo-Pacific vision, which uh, it is promoting in the region. And we had a leadership change in Japan from Prime Minister Abe to Prime Minister Suga. And we have a global focus on the Indo-Pacific region with France and Germany releasing their Indo-Pacific guidelines just last year. So Professor Tsuruoka, I would like to start with you. So what do you think will Japan be dealing with in the next years? What do you, how do you expect the US-Japan alliance will evolve and uh, how will they cooperate? Where do you see opportunities and challenges? So please give us your evaluation on these issues. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very uh, much uh, looking forward to this. Uh, the Yes, it's a really important day. So the new administration is going to be inaugurated in DC. And uh, so we are closely following, of course, the event. But of course, the, what we have been seeing over the past uh, few weeks is not quite reassuring. So the, yes, the new era is going to start, but at the same time, we should have no illusion um, about the prospect of particularly the, the, the domestic uh, and the politics and domestic situation in the United States. So, so there are still uh, so many uh, things, to, things to be concerned about. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's I think, uh, where we are. The, the, so, so the, over the past four years, yes, there are, we, we have seen a series of uh, problems and crises and challenges. Of course, not only from the Trump administration, there, there are various um, challenges to the what we call rules-based international order. So first and foremost, uh, no challenges from China are, are increasing and also challenges from Russia and challenges from, from other parts of the world as well. So there, there are so many challenges. So, so, so the change of the administration in the US is a big thing, but uh, it's, it's, it's not a panacea for, for, for the problems we have. And uh, Japan-Europe relationship has, has improved and has developed and quite, quite remarkably over the past four years. So the, to some extent, it's just a coincidence that over the past four years, the, the Japan-Europe relationship developed and it was under the Trump administration. But it's not 100% coincidence. That's, uh, that's what we, we need to acknowledge because the, so, so remember the situation in the, in the early, in the, the first half of uh, 2017. So the, still the Brussels and Tokyo were negotiating a EPA, but uh, the negotiations were not quite going well. But uh, the, that negotiations were very much stimulated by Mr. Trump's protectionist rhetoric and action, and the protectionist uh, and act behaviors. So, the, so we managed to, 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 to sign the deal and, uh, and, and uh, we now have EPA. So the, at least partially, we have to thank Mr. Trump for the development of Europe-Japan relations. That's, uh, that's a sort of a footnote that uh, I wanted to put at the beginning. The, the, the Japanese perceptions about the incoming Biden administration, to be quite honest, that uh, particularly looking at uh, the foreign security policy community people, the, there are so many people who are still wondering whether the, the Biden administration is going to be tough enough on China, because we have some memories still uh, of the Obama administration. And uh, during that time, many Japanese experts and officials were complaining that uh, the US was too soft on China. Of course, the situation has changed quite a lot on the ground. So the, the Biden, Biden's uh, China policy is not going to be like Obama's China policy, that's for sure. But at the same time, the, there are still some concerns in Tokyo. And uh, so, so the, and also the, 
the, we, we have some perceptions in Tokyo that uh, the, the people who are going to join the new administration are mostly focusing on improving relations with Europe and uh, also the the, 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 the working on the Iranian uh, nuclear issue, so reviving the, 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 the JCPOA and other things. And so, so the, the focus may not be on Asia or China. And that sort of concerns are still there. But uh, just uh, we, we have just heard uh, the, the, the confirmation hearing of the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense. And uh, both people emphasized the, 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 the importance of dealing with China. So I, I think that is a reassuring thing. So the, whether you like it or not, China is there as a challenge and perhaps the biggest challenge for the United States. So the, the, the Americans need, need, to, need, need to address that challenge. So the, that is why the Indo-Pacific thing there is going to, to, to continue as well. So whether the new administration is going to use the term free and open Indo-Pacific FOIP or not, the, the, the important thing is that uh, the, the, the on the ground, the, the importance of this region, the Indo-Pacific region, the significance of that is not going to change. So, so that we are quite confident that uh, under the new administration, we, we, the, the US-Japan alliance, uh, I think is going to be going to be, be strengthened over the next uh, you know, four years or eight years. So, so, so we are quite confident about that. Um, perhaps a few words uh, also on uh, how to deal with China in, 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 in this new context. The, I, th I, I think the, the, the Japanese, and, and, and also that uh, in Tokyo as well, we, we have new prime minister. So after the longest serving prime minister, Mr. Abe, so now Suga is in charge. So, but so we are still wondering what sort of foreign policy he's going to have. So the yes, the on the one hand, Suga has been saying that he's going to he, he's going to continue what Abe was doing, and uh, that's that's for sure. So including the FOIP, the free and open in the Pacific idea and initiative that's going to continue. But as for China, what Suga, Mr. Suga, is emphasizing is that uh, we want to we we want to maintain stable relations with China. So nothing wrong. So there, of course, everyone wants to have stable relations with Beijing. So there, but uh, the beyond that, we 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 don't have a clear idea. So the, but uh, what is important is that uh, the yes, the, we want to maintain stable relationship, which of course includes the uh, economic and partnership aspect. But at the same time, how how we can uh, a, a continue strengthening the defense and, uh, defense and security aspect and the deterrence and defense posture of the US-Japan alliance. So, so it's, a, it's a sort of delicate and uh, a balanced game. But uh, this, this sort of balance, the, the maintaining economic re relationship and, uh, and the strengthening defense posture at the same time simultaneously, that's uh, not, not a challenge unique to Japan, but uh, also the Europeans, um, that, that, that's a challenge that the Europeans have. So in that sense, I would argue that uh, the Japanese and the Europeans uh, share a lot in terms of how to deal with China. So we don't have any consensus on that. So the, and in that context, uh, we, we need to talk to the new administration, the, the, the Biden administration. So, so the, the how to deal with China among Europeans, Japanese and Americans, uh, I, I think this, this sort of a new uh, lateral uh, coordination or cooperation uh, is, is going to be become more important over the next four or eight years. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. I uh, absolutely agree with you. Uh, United China strategy will be probably the most important challenge and uh, also um, how the Japan and uh, Europe relations and cooperations will evolve. So Celine, I would like to turn to you. So where do you see the opportunities and obstacles for you Japan partnership under the Biden administration? And do you think the Biden administration will possibly impact uh, European strategic choices in the region? So how are your thoughts on these issues? Please give us your insights. Okay, thank you very much, Eli, for the kind introduction, and thank uh, thanks a lot also, uh, Yanka, for having me for this discussion this morning. Um, so I will try to address your question in a few minutes that I have for the <laughs> the, the starting st statement. 
Um, so that's not a secret that the election of Mr. Biden was greeted with a great uh, sense of relief uh, in Europe after the tough year that we had to uh, to, to deal with uh, with Mr. Trump, uh, America first policy. And uh, the Biden already sent um, quite positive uh, signals of a more kind of normalized uh, posture, both in terms of method, uh, with the, the, um, Japan, the US coming back to uh, multilateralism and also putting a lot of effort to repair the relationship with, uh, with allies and partners and work more closely with them in the future. Uh, also, more. Um, uh, normalized posture in terms of uh, substance uh, uh, with a commitment to uphold the, the rules-based order and um, a greater convergence of um, in terms of priorities and uh, maybe position also with the EU and Japan so when it comes to key issues like uh, climate change, uh, health governance, uh, maybe data uh, governance, uh, trade, and and so on. So overall, the the um, you know election of uh, of Mr. Biden is uh, is uh, quite uh, positive. Uh, I believe for the for the two relations, it make it will make the transatlantic and the, the U.S. Uh, Japan relation easier uh, to manage. Uh, I believe. I think the also the Biden. Um, will likely encourage uh, its allies and partner to uh, to work together uh, to uh, to network together and this uh, will also uh, encourage the EU and Japan to strengthen their uh, partnership and uh, thirdly as uh, Michito said uh, the, the greater convergence of view uh, with the Biden administration will also uh, provide more incentive to develop a trilateral consultation and cooperation at the global level uh, for the, the three countries to advance a kind of a common agenda. Um, so I believe in the Biden's visions where um, the US also relies on its uh, partner to uphold the rules-based order, the, the US, the EU-Japan uh, uh, partnership uh, will be um, even more uh, significant and even more relevant because that's already what is uh, going the eu japan's partnership is um, a real um, normative uh, force so to say trying to shape the the rules and, uh, and norms uh, in terms of uh, of trade environment and so on through the the epa and also trying to promote the uh, the values and the liberal principles through their spa so i think uh, all that is quite quite positive. Uh, but this said, I would like to um, add two caveats uh, to this positive assessment. And the first one relates to uh, what uh, Michito said about um, the fact that uh, the Trump factor was uh, actually quite uh, important to um, to to make the EU and Japan, um, you know work together and accelerate uh, the, the the negotiation for the uh, for the EPA and SPA and under the Biden administration the two partners might not uh, feel the same kind of urgency uh, to uh, to develop their their cooperation so maybe we'll uh, need to 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 put a more um, effort uh, and more attention to, uh, to to keep up the, the momentum on on, uh, on developing the, the, the partnership. Uh, and at the same time, and this is also a second caveat, um, I believe that the, the greater convergence of interest uh, with the Biden administration does not mean that we will see alignment uh, of the, the US with its uh, partners and allies and especially uh, with, the, with the EU. Um, the US will have to make a lot of uh, efforts to regain uh, the trust from its partner grew more autonomous and more proactive uh, also uh, during the past four years. And because the, um, the partners are also quite um, skeptical about the, the return of, uh, of the US uh, leadership in a, in a very uh, efficient uh, manner. So I believe the, um, the allies and partners will likely continue in some way to try to hedge again a, a, a US uh, that would be more 
inward looking, uh, maybe, and they will try to do it by uh, developing their own um, capabilities to diversify uh, their uh, own partners, and also to try to more um, resolutely defend their own kind of um, national or regional uh, interest, especially in the context of the of the U.S.-China uh, competition. And I believe this is um, what the EU uh, strategic autonomy is about. And uh, this, um, you know, the manifestation of this strategic autonomy can be quite uh, disturbing, may have quite disturbing effect. And here I would like to, to provide two, two illustrations. And the first one is the, um, the MOU on the, the EU-China investment deals that we've seen uh, last uh, December. Of course, so why um, it does signal some kind of EU autonomy, um, as Brussels did not wait for Biden to decide on such a thing. Well, it's also, um, it also appears in stark contradiction with the recent trends that we've seen in Europe, Europe going uh, more um, geopolitical more cautious, uh, more tough on uh, on China uh, during the, the last years. And um, it generated a lot of uh, controversies and confusion. Um, it sent uh, quite uh, negative uh, political signals that uh, uh, European may appear to, um, to give up on their political values for uh, economic reason with China. Uh, so I believe we we should stay uh, prudent and um, avoid maybe to make um, a final uh, judgment, decisive um, uh, judgment about uh, this deal because uh, obviously the text is not uh, published yet and it's not, um, the deal is not made yet. Uh, so the negotiation we will uh, we're still going on, but um, at least for now, it's creating a lot of uh, discussions uh, in Washington, if not if not tension with uh, with Washington. Uh, so we'll have to 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 deal with that. Uh, I I'm, I don't know if their tension will be long lasting or not. There is a, a high level dialogue um, that was uh, launched between the EU and uh, and the US on China, and maybe this will be useful to Iran up uh, the, the, the differences. Um, but the, this move by the, the EU vis-a-vis um, -vis China might also create some unease and maybe reinforce uh, Japan's anxieties about uh, how um, the EU is uh, dealing and how uh, the EU is perceiving uh, China. So I would be also interested to get the fear, some feedback from, uh, from, uh, from Michito uh, on, on this. Um, so my, my second illustration is the, an, actually an opinion poll that was just released yesterday by the ECFR. And I, I guess we will uh, talk a, a bit more about it uh, in, in the discussion. It's, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, and it shows among uh, other, other things that a majority of the European uh, public opinion would like their countries to stay neutral. Um, in case of a US-China conflict. So I think this is quite uh, so um, surprising and maybe also disturbing uh, kind of uh, kind of results that we, we, we can uh, further discuss. And for sure, I believe this uh, kind of neutral posture is certainly different uh, from the one of uh, Japan that clearly stick uh, and will stick uh, with, with the US, uh, even though when you look at the, the opinion poll, so the, the image of the US actually deteriorated uh, quite, uh, quite significantly in Japan in recent years. Uh, but this said, I think that the, the Japan and the EU will um, still converge because they both want to try to mitigate um, the US-China uh, uh, competition or US-China um, confrontation. Uh, they both want to avoid a complete uh, economic decoupling uh, with China. Uh, 
even if they are willing to put some restriction on China on very uh, specific and strategic sectors. Uh, they both want to keep a conditional engagement uh, with China at some point, and we've heard some discussion about the, the legitimacy, the, 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 the fact to um, uh, separate or compartmentalize uh, the relation with China on the economic um, uh, sector and on more political sectors. And uh, this is a very important question and we should look at uh, so how Japan is dealing with China because it's, uh, uh, it's uh, I, I believe, quite um, skillful in a way to try to strike a balance in this relation with uh, with China. And uh, my, my third point is that uh, the EU and Japan both want to try to offer um, a kind of alternative or a third way uh, to the, the countries who do not want to, to choose uh, between the, the US, uh, the US and China. And um, in this context, I think this is also a common ground on which uh, the EU and uh, Japan can uh, work together and further advance uh, their relations and partnership in the in the future. Thank you, Celine. Um, yes, absolutely. I think uh, especially that a united China strategy, at least a discussion about some uh, some thoughts on that uh, is absolutely necessary since the whole region has changed and also the positions of each country has changed. So, um, Andrew, what do you think? What will the U.S. do? <laughs> How will the U.S. start in the region? Will they be able to have a united China strategy with Japan? How will they deal with the, their allies in the region and also with Europe as a new uh, player in the region? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, thanks very much, Ellie. Um, uh, and, and thanks for the chance to, to join the, the discussion today. Um, so jumping off immediately from this question, I'm going to make a few general points on what we might expect from Indo-Pacific and particularly China policy under the Biden administration. And I'm going to emphasize a lot of the implications for Europe um, uh, first, because I think there's a lot of angst about a new administration coming to office saying that it would like to consult with allies on China policy in the early weeks. Um, this seems to be felt almost as a source of pressure rather than the opportunity that I think it actually is. And, and a lot of my remarks are going to focus on, on that. Uh, so on the Biden approach, I'll begin with the points of commonality. I think it's clearly important strands of the Trump administration's approach that had bipartisan support and that we know will continue. Uh, the concept of the Indo-Pacific, I think, is now clearly part of broader U.S. strategy now and also reflects, I think, a deeper commitment in the U.S. government and in Congress to according higher priority to the wider region as the dominant regional theater. Um, and as Mishito mentioned, we, we saw that emphasis um, in the hearings yesterday um, from both um, the, the Dems and the Republicans. I think the Trump administration's fundamental reappraisal of China policy was understood to be necessary by the Biden people, um, and the view that competition with China has to treat economics, technology, ideology as almost essentially as it does military balancing will stick as well. Some of the most important moves that we saw in the last few years on export controls, investment restrictions, and some areas such as competing with the Belt and Road Initiative more effectively uh, came from Congress anyway and will also persist. Uh, though I think it's clear that the implementation in, in some areas such as supply chain realignment and technology restrictions is likely with the Biden administration to be better underpinned by modeling and more thorough consultation processes, both domestically and with international partners. Then we move on to the points of critique. I think the central one from, from the Biden team has been that the Trump administration was confrontational without competing effectively that it failed to mobilize allies behind US strategy, that it failed to address the domestic drivers of US competitiveness in a serious way, and essentially that it focused excessively on the kind of counter China dimensions of policy rather than on strengthening US capabilities. Uh, and then even on many of the goals that the administration ostensibly pursued on structural change to the Chinese economy uh, or democracy in Hong Kong were just completely undercut by the president's indifference to them. Uh, other points of critique that regional institutions in Asia and the multilateral space uh, in general wasn't taken seriously enough 
And also, I think that there was insufficient space preserved in the relationship with China to be able to pursue some kind of limited areas of cooperation where necessary and to manage conflict um, effectively between the two sides. I think the sense was that by the end uh, of the administration in particular, it had become a kind of all fronts confrontation without very clear priorities as to um, to where that made most sense. Uh, and I think some degree of a sense from, from, from Biden people as well that the Trump administration overestimated again how much the US could change China's behavior rather than kind of figuring out how to live with the fact that this was unlikely to happen. Whether you agree with all of these arguments or not, and I think lots of these propositions can be debated, um, I think they are likely to feed into the strategy that we will see pursued by the new administration, um, at least in the early days and the kind of intentions and priorities feeding into that more ally-centered and focused on stitching together allies in, in, in Europe and Asia, uh, more democratic values-based, uh, more of a kind of revived commitment to some of the institutions in Asia and globally that I think they'd seen, uh, the Biden people had seen being neglected, and I think more focus on the competition itself rather than the stop China elements of it, um, which at, at home, I mean, on the domestic front means more focus on industrial policy, the technology and innovation base, some of these areas, I think externally means a lot more focus on the positive sum sell to other countries uh, rather than just the counter China piece of this. What we don't know is what the shape of the US China relationship itself will look like and how it will be managed, even what really the intentions are behind that. Uh, we know what people don't want. Uh, we know they don't want the strategic and economic dialogue version of sort of mammoth engagement between the two sides. Uh, we know they don't want the behind closed doors Kissinger deal making version. And we also know that the aim of the new administration is to begin by consulting with allies and partners and building leverage even before the first serious exchanges with Beijing rather than kind of starting bilaterally on the US China front or doing that in parallel to the allies piece. I think there's less clarity on what form of US-China relationship is the desired result after that. Uh, there's language that we see around stable competition, and we've all read the same essays about these topics, uh, for reasons I think that relate to wider US policy in areas such as climate and Iran, there just are intrinsic areas where the US and China can deal with each other a bit differently from the way they did uh, under this administration. Um, but as Machito in particular was, was, was talking about, there's still quite a high degree of indeterminacy about what a stable model looks like on the US-China front. Um, and whether, uh, even though people are at pains to say this won't be the case, that avoiding friction is not an end in itself now, as maybe it was in the past, uh, whether that desire for stability to pursue certain cooperative goals in common is going to impact on policy choices in other areas, as it clearly did at points during the Obama administration, even though, again, people are at pains to say in areas like climate that it didn't. What does this mean for Europe in particular? Uh, on the European side, I think there's still a kind of tangible sense of insecurity that uh, if the Biden administration arrives offering to coordinate China policy more closely, that doing this seriously might involve some kind of subordination to US leadership. I think this attitude was understandable a decade ago when Kurt Campbell was kind of last rocking up to Brussels with his transatlantic Asia cooperation agenda, uh, but it seems to me to completely miss the point now. I think the Biden administration's approach is not just about getting plus ones for US strategy. Um, it's come out of a real recognition of the limits of uh, a unilateral approach that the Trump administration really successfully demonstrated um, uh, the limits of in, in the last few years with China. And I think a sense, therefore, that building collective leverage is kind of a necessity for US policy rather than a luxury. Uh, I see a much more chastened uh, and much more genuinely consultative uh, spirit about how this is being dealt with by the Biden team uh, as they're coming into office by comparison with the Obama approach as well, not just the Trump one. And I think some of the main issue areas the Biden administration will be looking to Europe on vis-a-vis -vis China, as well as Japan, uh, Trade, technology, standards, green transition, these are all areas of European strength, typically at peer level with the US. I think this is not just about being a junior partner in East Asia. And I think a more self-confident European approach would then look to shape and influence what an ally-based approach to China actually looks like and use that to gain leverage on European priorities and really help to define an, an approach to China collectively that we can live with, uh, rather than a lot of the current emphasis and language around strategic autonomy um, and, and claiming that signing a bilateral investment 
um, agreement with China, rather than waiting to give some of these coalition building efforts a serious shot, is a good example of strategic autonomy, which I think it really isn't. Uh, there's no question that China is going to try to undercut this push by the administration. Um, and I think we do have to ask very seriously on the European side whether our interests are going to be better served by building that collective leverage or playing along with some of the very transparent moves um, that we're seeing from China to kind of peel Europe away and whether we are in fact um, acting as an instrument of Chinese policy role and really um, pursuing an autonomous European role in that regard. I think this is generally an opportunity for Europe to revisit a number of difficult areas with the US, with China as the backdrop, um, all of which, again, really have a significant trilateral dimension with Japan as well. Data flows, technology regulation, WTO reform, carbon border, border adjustment mechanisms, all of these kinds of questions. Um, but I think it should be clear that the depth of cooperation in some of these areas is going to be affected by European strategic seriousness on China. That doesn't mean, I think, an identical stance with the US or anyone else, uh, but I think some degree of like-mindedness on China is starting to become a precondition for certain forms of cooperation among the major democracies, with the US, Japan, and India too, really at the center of that. And I think as a result of, as uh, Celine was mentioning about, this, uh, about the CHI, Europe is going into this year with some question marks uh, about its position in, whether that's in Tokyo or New Delhi, and, and certainly very much in, in Washington, D.C. I think it was understandable that people spent the last couple of years talking about how Europe should position itself amid the US-China confrontation. That was partly the right framing for a while. We would bear the brunt of various US decisions on, say, technology exports without being consulted properly on them. We couldn't even agree statements in G7 meetings without having to deal with a number of the administration's kind of less useful forms of confrontation with China. I think if we continue that framing now, though, uh, with an administration that shares far more of the fundamentals of European thinking on China-related matters and is really unlikely to produce the kind of purposeless confrontation irritants or these zero consultation policy impositions in certain areas, I think we'll land in the wrong place. I think our aim is not to carve out a distinct space and pursue differentiation for its own sake. Uh, we're never going to be able to marshal collective pressure on our priorities effectively with China um, if we're still so hung up on distinguishing our position that we just can't actually coordinate with other partners effectively, all of whom are dealing with an incredibly similar looking set of problems um, when it comes to dealing with China. Um, but fortunately, I hope at least that starting literally today, um, when people first uh, rock up to the, to, to the NSC, I'd hope that European focus will hopefully sharpen now on the fact that most of the problems that we're now gonna be dealing with are gonna be emanating from Zhongnanhai uh, rather than from the White House. Thank you very much, Andrew. So I would like to have just a final question also to Professor Tsuruoka because um, I think the, uh, the Japan has changed a lot. Japan has uh, become more self-confident in the last four years, has become more proactive. And recently you could read that Japan was having, will possibly take a placeholder role until the US is ready to come back in the region. So I possibly think that also negotiations with the US and also with the Europeans will be different between Japan and those countries, and especially in terms of the US-Japan alliance, than they used to be. So what do you think? Will there be a change? Will there be a change in negotiations in terms of strategy? And uh, do you think Japan will be more self-confident also in the negotiations in terms of the US-Japan alliance? What do you think? So, sorry, on negotiations on what? Uh, generally, on the on the alliance, on, in terms of the alliance okay. and, and on common ground finding in the alliance. Yeah, yeah so alliance management, alliance politics. Yes. Uh, those mm. more generally. Yes. Yeah. 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 The, yes, the, the alliance uh, negotiations, alliance dialogue, and alliance consultations, and that uh, uh, those, those things have uh, developed quite well over the past, uh, I think, uh, five or ten years. So the and that was very much uh, uh, driven and supported by the fact that uh, the, the 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 scope of activities of the Japanese Self Defense Forces have has expanded quite a lot over the past five years, particularly uh, the, the happened under the the Abe government. So the now that there are more and more more serious uh, joint exercises and even joint operations, particularly at sea. So between the US Navy and the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force. So the, we are doing a lot of uh, ISR activities, intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance activities, not just in the waters near Japan, but also in the, in the South China Sea as well. So the, 
in terms of this operational jointness, uh, operational cooperation between the two countries, that, that that is a sort of a backbone of what we're talking about the alliance now. And uh, uh, so, so in that context, of course, they had to deal with China in in, in military terms. That that's very much a a heart of our our alliance discussions, and how to counter Chinese or what we call A to A D, the anti access area denial capability, like uh, like air defense missiles, uh, anti ship missiles, and how, how to counter these things. And uh, so this the including those high-end things, and uh, we, we are more and more cooperating with the United States. So, so the, yes, the, the Trump, Mr. Trump as a person, I don't think he was very fully aware of, of, of what was taking place on the ground between the two militaries. But the overall sort of impression that uh, Japan is becoming a more reliable ally and more dependable, more capable ally, I think that perception uh, uh, I, I think uh, they uh, became more common among the the people in the in the policy community in, in DC, and that was very much uh, helpful in terms of thinking about the, the 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 development of the alliance. Thank you very much. So I would like to open the floor for questions, and uh, we also have a first question from Randolph Carr. Randolph, if you would like to ask your question, please zoom in. <laughs> oh, we can hear you. You are unmuted. No. So maybe until we have uh... We have found a solution for Radolf. We ask Frederick Rahr has a question to Andrew. So Frederick, would you like to ask your question? <laughs> so we have some technical difficulties. Never mind. I have, uh, until we open the Q&A session, I have some questions. So um, maybe, um, um, so what do you think? Uh, what should be the uh, alliance's uh, top missions and first missions also in terms of so okay i just hear i'm sorry i just hear randolph is back he will ask your question okay randolph yeah, am I floor is yours <laughs> okay uh good morning again everyone um thanks um first off thanks to the panel for for the Poignant remarks to start off. Um, I have a question on a kind of a specific aspect of Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, lately, I have the feeling we're hearing a trend towards saying that for the new Biden administration, joining TPP or re-engaging with TPP uh, is kind of a necessary component of an effective Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, so first off, um, I'd, I'd like to ask in how far you agree with that proposition. And second, um, what position does that put Japan in, in terms of facilitating um, that kind of re-engagement? And maybe to bring Europe in, um, what does it signal for Europe if uh, the U.S. Um, begins to re-engage with uh, liberalizing trade in the Indo-Pacific? Thanks. So who would like to answer that? Celine, maybe? Uh, OK, I, I don't want to, to talk for, for Japan. or I, I'm not a US expert neither, so <laughs> I just uh, <laughs> offer my, my modest uh, views and perspective on that. Uh, well, the TPP was indeed a key um, element in the Obama's uh, pivot uh, to Asia. And um, yeah, I believe that's, that, that would be uh, indeed a very uh, positive signal if the, the Biden administration could uh, get back in the game and, uh, and, uh, and join uh, the, the CPTPP that the, uh, Japan put a lot of uh, you know, uh, energy, political capital also to, 
try to 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 push and to save and uh, to keep a, uh, a seat for the for the US during all all this time. So I, I believe for the for the Japanese at least uh, that would be a very successful uh, achievement uh, if the US is back uh, is back in the in the TPP. Uh, and because the, the the TPP or CPTPP also, if if you look at it and. Um, and with the, the EU, uh, Japan, uh, EPA, if you look comprehensively to this uh, two, uh, two mega trade, free trade agreement, they all together create a very strong and comprehensive set of uh, framework for uh, norms and, and standard. And this is uh, really what is about, uh, the, you know, the international keeping up the, the international liberal order and uh, keeping up a kind of normative framework to um, as a way to try to to, to shape uh, China's choices uh, or try to uh, yeah to, to to influence or to integrate maybe at some point uh, China in this kind of uh, of system. So that would be very uh, very useful, of course, and um, and very well received also from uh, from the from the Europeans. That said, I. Um, I believe that it would be maybe very uh, difficult, uh, complicated for the Biden administration to to jump in and try to to address this uh, this issue or joining the TPP right now because he has is in full at home and uh, obviously yeah, to to deal with the uh, with the COVID and uh, he will have uh, to deal also with uh, with the Congress and a very divided opinion on. Uh, on uh, how to uh, to manage the, um, the trade relation and how to um, to make um, the way the, the US can make any any concession to uh, uh, to to join the, the, the TPP, which uh, has been already negotiated by uh, by others. Thank you, Professor. Do you also have a short comment on that? Oh yes, uh, ju just a few words, and of course, we very much welcome if the Americans uh, want to return to TPP, that's, that's very much welcomed. And uh, the, the Trump administration's uh, Asia policy or Asia Pacific policy or Indo-Pacific policy, yes, they, in military terms, I think uh, the Trump administration did a good job, or perhaps in some sense better than Obama. Uh, but uh, the economic dimension of US regional policy in the Asia Pacific or Indo-Pacific was sort of lacking. So the, the Trump, prefer to deal with and countries in bilateral terms so japan or china and other countries so the so this economic dimension multilateral economic dimension i think uh, was very much lacking so the we, we need that and also the the one of the most important aspects of obama's pivot to asia was the idea of strengthening relations with southeast asia the asean countries and that that very much disappeared under Trump. So that if that comes back, and that's also good. And uh, the, the expansion of CPTPP, the good news is that the UK is now planning to apply for that. So they perhaps later this year. So the, that's very much a welcomed movement, particularly from a Japanese perspective, because the, the Japan is the country which uh, helped to revive the, the the TPP after the Trump administration decided to withdraw from that. So the expansion of that is a good, is a sort of a, a evidence that the CPTPP is successful. So that's always good. And just to one final and a point, a related point is that uh, the last November, the CPTPP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, that includes China, Japan and uh, other countries, including Australia and some other countries in the region. That, that is another sort of a mega FTA. Yes, in terms of the quality of FTA, the RCEP is not quite high. So it's a primitive sort of FTA. But still, what is important is that China is in the framework. So the, in the absence of the US and in the absence of US leadership in this field, now the China is part of a huge FTA. So the how how to deal with this situation? So the, there are some the several frameworks without Americans, and the biggest framework, the CPTPP, uh, still lacks uh, U.S. membership. So this is about uh, who takes the lead in, in in building new rules for international trade, and it's not just about trade, international economy, including investment uh, regulation and other things. So the the 
a lot is at stake. So the, I very much hope that the uh, U.S. will one way or another come back to a multilateral <laughs> economic framework in the region. Yeah, absolutely. So we have two more questions. The first question is from Frederick Graar and then Hans Maul. So, Mr. Graar, please ask your question. Thank you very much. I've got actually two questions. One is for Andrew, uh, whom I'd like to say, uh, well, I, first of all, I'd like to say that I, I fully share your views on both the opportunity that the new situation presents, but also the need for the Europeans to demonstrate some seriousness about uh, collective action. Uh, you know, on the Indo-Pacific specifically, what should be the priorities uh, for Europe in terms of cooperation with the US, uh, given the fact that uh, the article by uh, Code Campbell in Foreign Affairs was the, the, the next or at least probable coordinator for uh, the Indo-Pacific on the US side, his article in Foreign Affairs was quite uh, general and didn't really give any real direction uh, as to what the the, the the U.S. intends to do. And I do have a second question to Professor Tsurulka, and that's a question that I intended to raise later. You mentioned the, 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 the positive uh, perspective on the Japanese size to the extension of the city, CPTPP to, uh, to the U.K., which is interesting because, uh, well, this, this is an idea which has been floating around for some time, uh, but would in effect add something, but not that much to the, uh, to the strengths of the agreement. Would you consider seriously an expansion to the CPTPP to Europe? Uh, because after all, France is a Pacific power and is probably more legitimate than the UK to do so. But what I'm asking you here is not whether France should be, but whether this should be a case for Europe to try to join in. I don't know if it technically makes sense, but in terms of value added to the um, to the uh, the agreement, that would probably compensate partly, at least, for the absence of uh, the U.S. and contribute to create that kind of middle power coalition that we see emerging in other sector of the segment. The the, the issue. So, Andrew, would you like to start? <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, thanks, uh, Frederic and, and Ellie. Um, I'd actually like to touch a little bit on the, the second bit of the question, uh, which goes back to, to the first <laughs> one again, which I think is extremely important on the, on the Europe-Japan uh, front, because I'm more skeptical about the degree to which the US is going to come back in and do the plurilateral trade agenda seriously. I, I think there are a lot of question marks about whether it's going to do CPTPP. Um, there's very low ambitions um, uh, and expectations when it comes to TTIP, I think there's virtually been abandoned the, the, the sense that it will be possible to go through and do that much more kind of comprehensive set of negotiations substantially pared down. As it does mean that this, because I mean, the, the original grand scheme of the plurilateral trade agenda had kind of two dimensions. If you are able to build the, the plurilateral piece, the European uh, EPAs, the TPP, all of these things, if you're able to put together a plurilateral trade agenda um, uh, that goes beyond everything that's going on in the WTO, then you'll have a kind of more resilient and integrated system between at least the kind of major trading, democratic trading partners, market-based trading partners. And so it will be valuable in its own right. It will be valuable for putting pressure on China and it will be valuable as a foundation for a more serious kind of comprehensive agenda in the WTO. Um, of course, all of this really depended on the US also playing a part in it. Um, but this Frederick's question about you know, the, the stitching together of this was ultimately, I think, the objective that we had to do the plurilateral piece for a while, um, but that ideally we'd be able to put together the TPP agenda, the European agenda in Asia, and kind of stitch this together into something broader. And I think there have been, there are at least provisional discussions about that, what that would all amount to, but we'd hope the US would kind of come back in and we'd kind of hold the fort, the US would step back in, and then we'd be able to do an enlarged version of it. I think it, it's, it looks as if Europe and Japan are going to be the main ones holding down the plurilateral trade agenda in, in, in the next period of time. And I, I do think precisely that that question, how how the middle power piece looks in a context in which 
there are some reasonable expectations that the US is still going to be a bit held back from, from that piece of things, which is a shame. Um, but I think we are going to have to deal with that, those sets of questions uh, more seriously. And that certainly, I, I would think, does involve prioritizing some of the now, how can we think more seriously about stitching together some of these pieces? We have all the building blocks in place with, in particular, the Europe Japan uh, EPA and, and, and CPTPP, but some of the other European APAs as well. And so I think there'd be a much stronger basis for, uh, for, for, for for more serious progress on, on, on that. On, on Frederick's first question, which I, I think I will actually answer more briefly, we are in this, like, I mean, I completely agree with, with, with what you said about um, Kirk Campbell's article. It's kind of direction of flow rather than a huge amount of detail in, in priorities. Um, I think we've heard that um, from a lot of the presentations from the new administration people in you know the last couple of weeks uh, as well. I, I do think we, we're sort of slightly we, we, we face the slight difficulty at the moment that um, in one way, people are waiting for the US to come in and roll out its new policy areas, uh, pr priorities in, in some of these fields. Um, uh, at the same time, the approach I do think is going to be genuinely more consultative in kind of listening to what the views and priorities are of some of the other partners. So I, I think your question, Frederick, is, is, is apposite. I, I think we should go with a clearer agenda uh, to the US in these early consultations on um, on what, what we see as the Indo-Pacific um, priority areas. And I, I'm sure you have a, a long list from, from your time working on, 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 on some of these things. My instinct is still that the, the, the best priorities on the transatlantic side in particular are still to kind of leverage uh, the European strengths rather than the just the kind of the, the old agenda that we maybe used to have um, a, a decade ago with 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 Kurt Campbell and, and, and in, in these areas, which was you know, much more focused on multilateral peace in Asia, some defense cooperation, more limited pieces on defense capacity building, all of which is, is useful. Um, but I think the move that we have towards looking more seriously at supply chains, connectivity agenda, all of the things that draw on European strengths when it comes to um, the uh, uh, trade, technology cooperation, um, and connectivity and development finance. I, I think a lot of these are going to be the areas, again, where we operate more at, at peer level with the US in some of these um, fields than the other areas, you know, the, the, it, which, which, you know, are, are going to be very France and, and the UK specific anyway, the FONOPS and, and, and all of these sorts of things where we still are going to be junior partners to, to, to the US. So, Professor, would you like to answer briefly on the first part of the question, yeah. which was referred to you? <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Frederick. Uh, it's really good to see you. Uh, the, the CPTPP expansion, yes, it, it makes sense for the UK be because of Brexit, because of really hard Brexit. UK is now in a position to apply for a CPTPP. But of course, they, we didn't really want to see that. So it's quite sad. So, so they, it doesn't make sense for France as a country to join CPTPP as long as it's a EU member. It's, it's, it's just impossible. Or the EU as a whole joining the CPTPP. I don't think it's, uh, it's technically possible or too complicated. So the, uh, the, so, so the CPTPP membership for the UK is a sort of a second best option as a result of hard Brexit. So, the, uh, but the another sort of aspect that uh, we we think this is a good idea to to welcome the UK in the CPTPP has to do with the symbolic aspect and the strategic aspect, because the this the the UK membership in CPTPP can be. Can, can can be seen as a very important pillar of what people call global Britain. So the Britain's role after Brexit. So the, it's a sort of a, a symbol that's uh, showing that Britain is not going to be inward looking. So they're more engaged in the world, including in the Indo-Pacific region. So, 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 the, so the idea of joining CPTPP, I think is a Symbolic has a symbol, symbolic value, so the, that, that's why it's important. And, and also for the UK, the, a bit of a small aspect of this is that uh, the, the CPTPP is a very comfortable group of countries because the six out of 11 countries are Commonwealth countries like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Singapore, Malaysia, Brunei. So they, it's, a, it's a, so, so I think uh, they can feel more comfortable in dealing with those countries. So that's another sort of a footnote type of aspect. 
So thank you. So because we have a lot of questions coming up and the time is passing, I would like to collect some questions and then you can answer all of them together. So I would like to have the questions of uh, Hans Maul and then Kazuto Suzuki and then Yoichiro Sato, please. Please, Professor Maul. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear Good. you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. This has been a splendid panel so far. I'm really grateful for the contributions. Uh, I have uh, three questions, I suppose. The first two are to Celine and Andrew, really, uh, but uh, obviously Mitchell is also welcome to comment. Uh, I very much like the notion of European strategic seriousness. I think that's a great uh, way to put it. But I would be interested, Celine and Andrew, in your assessment, whether you see in the performance of the European Union in the negotiation of the comprehensive agreement on investment, whether you see that strategic seriousness and to what extent. And related to that, my second question, that context is, where and who is that strategic seriousness in the European Union, actually? Where do you locate it? I mean, the way the uh, CHI negotiations seem to have gone is, it was rammed through, uh, to characterize a little, in the end, very much by Angela Merkel. Uh, so, you know, where is the locus and where should it be of this strategic seriousness? And then my last question goes more to Michito, um, and Michio, it's great to see you again here uh, in this way. Uh, we have now several uh, national uh, European strategies on the Indo-Pacific. There's the French, the German, and the Netherlands version. And I understand the European Union is also working on a strategy. Now, if you look at these individual national strategies, they strike me as really quite different in tone and substance. Of course, there are overlaps and there are commonalities, but there are also significant differences. Uh, in the approach, in the very approach taken by these different countries. And I would be interested in what you make of this difference, whether you see a chance there for the Europeans to develop strategic seriousness, to word this uh, term again, in terms of the free and open Indo-Pacific. Thank you very much. To answer that, we will collect also the question of Mr. Kazuto Suzuki, please. All right. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. OK. Um, well, thank you very much for the panel. Uh, it was a great discussion. My question, uh, similarly following to the previous one, is the, uh, how do you see the, uh, the uh, strategic objective of the Biden administration vis-a-vis uh, -vis China? I think uh, Michito has mentioned uh, uh, the United China strategy is the biggest challenge, and I, I agree with that. But um, I, I think there is a general understanding uh, that the military uh, strategic uh, objective is uh, quite uh, obvious and clear that to, 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 to deter China. But the economic strategic objective doesn't seem to be clear to me. And during the Trump administration, and if the Biden uh, continues the strategic objective of the uh, Trump administration, what will be the economic strategic objective to, towards China? I think that during the Trump administration, there was a sort of a very acute uh, sense of the uh, security risk particularly in the supply chain and the, uh, and the uh, trade with China. So there was a very aggressive and unilateral uh, approach was taken. And I think the approach will be different, but the point is whether the um, Biden administration will uh, aim to, to the similar strategic objective of, by, uh, of Trump administration or not. And whether Europe and Japan can be on the same page towards this strategic objective. So I'd like to hear the, uh, how panel thinks of that. Thank you. Okay, and the final question goes to Mr. Yuichiro Sato, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my question is about uh, the strategic arms control. And I think 
uh, anybody on the panel who would like to answer, maybe uh, please answer my question. Uh, Russia and China are developing intermediate range missiles and the INF treaty-based arms control is uh, uh, pretty dead. And given this situation, is there any united European stance on how to deal with this growing problem? Can the European approach, if there is one, find a parallel in East Asia? Thank you very much. So let's start with the EU strategic seriousness, then go to strategic objective of the Biden administration, and then the final question on strategic arms control. Celine, would you like to start? Sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, good question. Uh, very, very uh, controversial uh, this day to talk about uh, this uh, investment deal. Um, so, uh, as I said in my pre preliminary remark, I believe this uh, move was uh, very uh, disturbing uh, in a way because uh, nobody really expected uh, the deal to be signed uh, so soon uh, because we know that... Uh, there was not really a consensus. There was a lot of uh, complicated um, uh, issues that needed to be sought out. And also because, um, you know, uh, end of uh, 2020, uh, it was, it looked like a very, very uh, bad timing to, um, to, to, uh, to greet, uh, in a way, uh, China, such kind of, uh, of political win uh, after the, um, what we, we, we've seen as China taking advantage of the, of the pandemic to, uh, to advance uh, uh, its uh, interest and to, to be more assertive uh, diplomatically um, uh, with the move we, we saw also on, uh, on Hong Kong and, uh, and so on. Um, so to yeah to say the least was very uh, very confusing uh, very uh, disturbing and um, for sure we lacked um, at least a strategic uh, communication uh, I mean if, if we want to 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 have this strategic autonomy and this strategic uh, seriousness uh, we need also to have a, a strategic communication to be able to um, uh, to tell uh, the story, to to explain uh, the the rationale uh, be, be behind the, this kind of uh, of moves, uh, because right after we heard a, we heard a lot of um, well funded, I think, uh, criticism. Um, it created a lot of uh, tension and frictions, and. Um, co um, discussion even within the EU uh, exploiting maybe the, um, the, the division uh, of views and the way, you know, um, many people said, well, that's a deal um, that, um, that uh, Mrs. Uh, Merkel and uh, Germany and the, the German automotive industry wanted to push and, uh, and we, we made concession to, to them and uh, the, the other were not, um, did not agree uh, on this. And I think that maybe the, the story is more uh, complicated than that. And uh, also, as I said, the, the, the deal is not concluded yet. And uh, I hope that um, the European Parliament will make uh, its, um, you know, um, its work and, uh, and uh, looking at this, uh, this agreement with uh, the political values uh, in mind and trying to, uh, to, to reach a real, uh, real concession and, uh, and real binding uh, commitment uh, from the from China. So, uh, so yeah, that would be my uh, my uh, my short answer uh, on uh, on this. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I believe this is uh, this is uh, quite uh, confusing and <laughs> still a lot, a lot to say. That, but I, I guess Andrew also will have plenty yeah. to, to add on this. Yeah, Andrew, would you like to continue? Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, uh, so, no, I do not see the Kai signing, uh, rather the political agreement reached on, on the Kai in December as strategic seriousness. It's either st strategic unseriousness or free riding or strategic nihilism or there are, there are various other things that one could call it. I, I don't think it's strategic seriousness. Um, I think there would have been a 
there would have been a version in which that same deal, um, which is not necessarily intrinsically so, so, so bad, the, 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 the Kai was agreed in September when the Leipzig summit would have taken place that could have been seen as, okay, China has taken the step to salvage the Sino-European relationship, which was in a bad way. Um, you, you may, with the uncertainty about the US elections coming up, decide to kind of take a deal like that. Um, doing the deal in December in this kind of um, phase of um, kind of purda for the Biden transition uh, was just, that felt like free riding, that it was China stepping in to try and immediately undercut these new coalition building efforts and that Europe exploited the pressure that was starting to build on China to cash in on a bilateral deal rather than waiting to pursue those efforts seriously and did so quite knowingly. Um, I think this was framed that, that the impetus from China to do this in this window before the new administration took office was described as a kind of strategic opportunity or something. Um, uh, people knew what they, they, they were doing with this. So um, I, I, I think the kind of nihilism aspect is it reflects really high degrees of pessimism um, about what was actually what might have been possible for Europe if we'd waited. Um, uh, and I, 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 I would hope, and this is in the earlier presentation as well, I hope we can be a bit more self-confident about what's, what, what's possible um, in that regard. Um, clearly, there is, uh, the, in terms of the kind of locus point question of, of, of European strategic seriousness on, 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 on this, um, I mean, this did also feel like a kind of last gasp of Chancellor Merkel to hold together a version of the EU-China relationship for which essentially the political consensus in Europe is now gone. Um, I hope that the Kai moment can be used to kind of pivot to dealing with the competitiveness and rivalrous elements more seriously, that we can kind of pocket this and say, okay, here's the cooperative slice that we've now agreed. Now let's do all of the things where I actually think the agenda that's been laid out um, in, in the last year or so um, since the strategic communication, the agenda on lots of this is, is, is quite good. I don't think we're lagging behind in terms of the ideas on what a strategically serious um, European China policy or, or wider approach looks like. I think we're lacking the political will, particularly um, in the chancellery here in, in Berlin, to execute that properly. And there's just been a lot of foot dragging on this. And, and this was much worse than, than foot dragging what, what we saw in, in, in December. So I think this is a kind of post-Merkel era question, essentially, um, in terms of, and, and so I, I hope there'll be a lot of work done to kind of build that out on the European side uh, over the next year. Um, very briefly then on the, on the Biden um, administration priorities. Um, if you look at the, the the working groups during the the Biden campaign, supply chains were one of the few areas, and, and in fact, the, among the very few public documents that was released by the Biden campaign, supply chains was one of the main areas that they they laid out. Um, I think there are going to be quite a few areas of continuity of priorities when it comes to supply chains, structural economic reform in China, and, and these sorts of things. But I, as, as I mentioned before, I think pursued more seriously, more seriousness about what industry thinks about these things, uh, more seriousness about consultation with, with, with other partners. But I think lots of the content is the same. It just means that you don't have commerce kind of throwing out these new rules um, that everyone has to suddenly adjust around. Um, I, I think that will look different even if some of the objectives are the same. But really, I think the critical difference is still going to be that there will be a focus on strength strengthening the US kind of competitive edge, um, industrial policy, immigration policy, a whole series of these other areas. Um, I think the sense is that the US has to compete by being better and maintaining its own edge and strengthening its own capabilities and doing so in, in conjunction with partners rather than just the kind of preventing China getting access to um, technologies and, and these sorts of things. I think that's going to be a very big difference in emphasis, but I think some of the uh, some of the objectives of the last administration, which frankly the president didn't share on, on the trade front anyway. I, I think the objectives pursued by the president on this actually look very different from, from, from you know, the Lighthizer priorities and, 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 and things like this. Many of the objectives that a Lighthizer or, 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 or some of the other figures in the Trump administration wanted to pursue, uh, I think actually some of those will carry across to the new administration, um, just I, I think pursued in a much more strategically serious way. So, Professor Zuroka, do you also have a very, very short answer on this question you would like to say? Because we have two okay, more very, questions. Very, very, <laughs> okay, very short answer for the moment. Yeah, the, the, but, but one word on the European strategic seriousness. What I can say is that Europe is becoming more serious 
that's for sure. So compared to five years ago, 10 years ago, the Europeans are far more serious on, on China. That's for sure. So, so it's about a glass half empty, half full type of argument for, for the sake of fairness. The, the different countries have different sorts of uh, Indo-Pacific strategy or policy. That's quite true. So there are huge differences and different countries have different priorities. And I think it's just natural. So some countries uh, focus more on uh, economic and trade things uh, like Germany. So more focusing on ASEAN. So that's uh, that's quite an important aspect. And uh, the French uh, strategy paper is very much about maritime security and for good reasons. So the, I think we are still in the very early phase of discussions about European Indo-Pacific strategy. So I think it's just good that different countries come up with different sort of ideas and then bring those things together and sit down and discuss things in the EU context or NATO context or other more flexible uh, context. So the yeah, the seeing from Japan, the, it's it's always good that more and more European com countries getting more involved and engaged in the Asia uh, Indo-Pacific issues. So, so that I'm not hugely concerned about the differences between the various uh, documents. And final word on the, the strategic arms control or nuclear arms control, INF is uh, because no one picked up <laughs> that uh, the the yes, the INF treaty is gone, so it's highly highly unlikely for us to be able to revive that. And also the START Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, New START Treaty is also the, something that uh, the, the Russians and uh, Americans need to deal with in the next few weeks. So the, but the problem is that uh, how and whether they can really involve China because there is no appetite in China to, to get involved in arms, uh, nuclear arms control uh, negotiations. So the Russians say that uh, if you want to involve China, then why not UK or why not France? And uh, French and the Brits, they, they don't want to be involved in this. So, they, But Americans, some Americans say that uh, it could be a good idea as a sort of price to get China on board, to get involved, uh, get, get uh, the, the, the UK and France involved. But uh, I think it's highly, highly complicated and difficult. So, so they ask for INF. Uh, think that it's it's uh, it, it's just impossible and start. I, I think I'm I'm reasonably optimistic that uh, the two countries, the US and Russia, uh, will be able to to agree on something. Thank you very much. So, because we have only five minutes left, the final two questions of Mr. Bonji O'Hara and Vera Phillips. Thank you very much, and, uh, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you for panelists for the uh, informative uh, discussion. Now, I'd like to ask the uh, uh, European experts about the uh, your recognition about China's uh, economic activities, because uh, uh, China uh, is scared of the uh, uh, Biden administration uh, put pressure from the uh, uh, East by the uh, TPP and uh, from the West, from the uh, TTIP, uh, it is the uh, economic. Uh, sorry, uh, it is the uh, uh, economic uh, activities. The uh, China uh, is uh, used the uh, uh, collective security concept. Uh, which was raised by Xi Jinping in 2014, and uh, they uh, integrate the, uh, all of the means uh, in the security. Uh, so uh, include uh, military means and also the economic means and also other means. So the uh, uh, so operation with the uh, uh, European countries like the uh, uh, agreement of the investment and also the uh, joining the uh, TPP uh, also uh, uh, make China to get the uh, uh, advantage uh, to uh, decrease the uh, pressure from the uh, US. So uh, uh, I'd like to ask the uh, European expert to, uh, uh, about the uh, Chinese uh, economic activities from the uh, security aspect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. O'Hara. And then we have Vera Phillips and the panelists, please answer super, super brief because we have to close, unfortunately, this session on time. So Vera Phillips, here goes your question. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And I will start the clapping, um, not because suggested, but because it's a really great panel. And then my um, hopefully very short question, which goes a bit back to the beginning, when we talked about uh, trade partnerships and others. And um, what I would like to take up is the issue of standard setting that uh, I think somebody has his mic on. It might be yeah. Well, yeah. Someone has I am, his microphone. I'm not sure how my voice is. Yes. <laughs> Just continue. <laughs> we can hear you. <laughs> About standard setting as a very important part of the game um, that we are uh, playing or will be playing, um, especially also in the Asia Pacific, and of course, an important means to set standards is to conclude partnerships. Um, and now um, we have our CEP, which was called a wake-up call here in Europe. Um, and we have usually very high barriers that are posed by the EU for good reasons, I would say. But we have seen an agreements also with Japan um, and with the US, which never came about, that those uh, barriers can be prohibitive. Now, if Japan and the EU want to move together and set standards my question would be where is the common ground um where can those two big economic blocks actually agree on a common set of standards that can uh, also bring others along and where do you think do we need to be flexible i'm talking about investment i'm talking about uh, ILO norms, I'm talking about economic standards. I'm, I'm not sure who would be the right expert to answer that question, but I would like to have your thoughts on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So your super brief answer, Celine, please start. Okay, um, very briefly. Um, <laughs> I don't know where to start, but um, maybe how, how uh, you and uh, Japan can work together to stand st to to set up standards and promote standards and norms. Well, they are already doing that uh, with the, the the EPA, obviously, but they are also working together, uh, be it in the OECD or uh, G20 or G7 summit or other uh, kind of uh, international uh, setting. Um, we uh, both agree on a very large uh, set of. Uh, of approach, uh, being it on um, on the data um, regulation, governance, uh, and so on. So we we, sh we share a lot together. So I think it is not a, a big issue to uh, to to promote that. And I think the the, the fact that the, the Biden administration might, might be more aligned, uh, might converge with uh, with uh, our position, might uh, facilitate even more this uh, this coordination at uh, at the global level. Um, and maybe just uh, another very quick point about um, Chinese uh, economic coercion and uh, how to try to to work together to uh, to prevent and to uh, to try to mitigate this co coercion I, I believe will be also a very um, key um, issue to 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 reflect on and to to work with uh, with uh, with Japan and and the US and uh, as Andrew said uh, looking at uh, you know the resi resilience of the supply uh, chains and, and so on uh, will be uh, important aspect of the of the questions. Thank you. So, Andrew, your final sentence. <laughs> yeah, um, just a brief answer to Bunchi Ohara. I, I think we have to distinguish between moves that China takes that are kind of cheap offers to undercut coalition building and the fact that some of the coalition building is supposed to induce change in China's approach. If China makes certain economic changes domestically, if it moves to higher standard Belt and Road, all of these sorts of things, that's partly what the coalition building work is supposed to induce on China's part, to, to see that it's facing these pressures and push it to rebalance what it's, it's doing. We're not seeing that yet. We're seeing the cheap offers to buy people off um, at, at this stage. Um, and what we're seeing on the domestic strategy from China economically 
fuel circulation, on building more dependencies of others that China can then weaponize or instrumentalize is precisely the opposite of that. So I think we have to view all of that so far with, with a lot of um, uh, skepticism. But if, if China does make some of these positive moves that undercut the necessity for some of the coalition building, then we should accept that as a success. Professor Zuroka, your final words. Okay, final sentence. Uh, the, uh, as for standard setting, uh, yes, the, that, that's really important issue, but uh, there are so many issues, so, so we have to prioritize <coughs> what is really important. So the like export control, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, digital thing, data. So I think these are the, the things that uh, we need to prioritize. But uh, the in that sense, uh, my sort of a small worry is that uh, the European idea of economic sovereignty or digital sovereignty, uh, that could complicate these discussions between Europe and Japan and Europe and the United States. So the, I, I have a bit of worries, but uh, the, the, uh, I think now the, it, it's really a, a good time to, to start a new, new conversation about Europe, Japan, uh, or trilateral, including mm -hmm. the United States. So I, I have just, uh, just a few, few minutes ago, I, I learned that uh, the Japanese Prime uh, Foreign Minister Motegi is going to attend the, the Foreign Affairs Council of the EU next Monday to mainly talk about uh, Indo Pacific issues for the first time for the Japanese Foreign Minister to attend uh, the EU Foreign Minister's meeting. So, so I think that should be a, a a great start for a new sort of period of Europe, Japan and cooperation under Biden administration. So they, of course, including the trilateral <laughs> as well. Good start. Thank you very much. Wonderful final words. So we've reached the end of our session. I thank you very, very much for this very interesting and pleasant discussion and also for these wonderful questions. There are still lots of things to discuss and uh, we will hopefully have uh, some other opportunities to continue our final discussion. So I head back to Janka. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellie, for steering us through the first conversation of this early morning. And I think what we can definitely say is that it was a rich conversation already and that it is sad that we have to say goodbye to all of our viewers on the live stream, but that I am very glad that we still have three more sessions to go for the Japan Europe Forum because I think we still have lots of things that need to be discussed and that have been put on the table here. Um, I think Celine has put it quite quite, uh, quite well when she said there is no automatism um, in the new Biden administration that Europe and Japan will have to work hard um, in kind of making this work and reestablishing the rules. And I think we can continue to work on the kind of the policy agenda around that in the next few hours and tomorrow morning. So with this, thank you very much to our splendid panel for an exceptional start to this day. I will see all of our participants in the Zoom call again at 10.15 with the Stella Tara Varma, director of our Paris office, continuing with the Indo-Pacific agenda. Uh, and I thank everyone who watched on the live stream and got up so early in the morning to be with us. Um, and uh, I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.